Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Amy Chepkovich. I'm the Director of Education and Communications at the Lower Marion Conservancy. Um, and in a short moment, I will introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Michelle Detweiler, who will speak about or deliver her talk, Incorporating Native Plants into Your Space, a Roadmap for Action. Um, before I do that, um, I want to just introduce the Lower Marion Conservancy. We are a member supported nonprofit that works to protect the history, um, nature, and streams of Lower Marion and Narber. Um, and this is actually a milestone year for us. It is our 25th anniversary. So we've been doing this work since 1996, serving your community um, and doing amazing projects like the Delmont Avenue Green Street. And we have a few more Green Streets uh, in the works for our community. Um, and much more to come. So I encourage you all to follow along, follow us on social media, join our email list, um, so you can stay updated on all of our 25th anniversary events um, and all the fun we have to come this year. So uh, I also wanted to thank um, St. Joe's for making this webinar possible. They help host our um, larger events on their larger Zoom platform. So I just wanna give a shout out to St. Joe's University for helping us out. Um, and finally, um, I just want to say that um, thank you to everyone, uh, all of our members who are on this call and those of you who donated. Um, we know this is a free program, but your membership donations and additional gifts for programs like this um, help make these free and make it possible for other people um, and other events in the future. So thank you so much for everyone who has supported us this past year. Um, if you haven't supported or renewed your membership this year, I'm going to throw our donation link in the chat after I'm done giving the whole introduction spiel, um, and you can do make a gift there. So thank you again to all of our members um, and all of you who are joining tonight. Um, so our speaker tonight is Michelle Detweiler. She is a self-proclaimed wild uh, native plant enthusiast, um, and she runs a company called Wild About Native Plants, where she gives... Um, native plant consultations for your home, help you um, plan and your native gardens and really create landscapes that um, yourself, your family and wildlife um, will be happy with. Um, and she's gonna get way into that. Um, but in the chat, I'm also gonna put a link to her website, which is wildaboutnativeplants.com. And um, if you are getting started on natives or you need advice, she has amazing resources for plant suggestions, light suggestions, um, tips on how to go pesticide free, all of these things and more on her website. Um, so Michelle, I will go ahead and let you take it from here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, and one more thing, questions, throw them in the chat. We'll have time at the end. So we'll save them for then. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. I'm certainly appreciative of the work of the Lower Marion Conservancy in our community. So really appreciate you. And uh, in addition to consulting on native plantings, I also work at Redbud Native Plant Nursery where I, where I help people um, select plants there. And I'm also a Pennsylvania master naturalist. So I really care about our native plant communities and consider them part of our human community on earth. And I hope to help empower you to sort of maximize the potential in your space uh, for supporting plants and animals. My favorite place to see native plants is in their natural environments, of course, where they've evolved so effortlessly with other plants. I also love to see plants return to urban spaces. So this happens to be Deep Ellum, Dallas, Texas here, once the Blackland Prairie. And uh, they return some native plantings that you can see along the roads here, you know, functional green infrastructure for the urban environment, but a whisper of that original ecology that might have been present at the time. So if they can do it in the built environment here, we can do this anywhere. These were early thinkers in the 20th century on the East Coast concerning natural landscaping. Edith Roberts was a botany and ecology professor at Vassar. And she partnered with Elsa Riemann, who was a landscape architect. And they endeavored to encourage homeowners 
to landscape with the native plant communities that they saw growing in Dutchess County, New York. And they published these articles uh, in, news, in, in magazines and then in this book called American Plants for American Gardens. It doesn't include any, any pictures, it just includes prose. And they talk about our native plant communities like the oak woods. And they talk about the flaky silvery gray of the white oak trunks and the understory trees that would have been the lacy twiggage of the hop hornbeam and the arching witch hazel stems and the horizontal dogwood branches, sort of inspiring us to think about what we were seeing in natural communities and incorporating those in the home environment. And we still see remnants of these natural plant communities where we live. These are the arching stems of the witch hazels in the understory in the winter and the seed heads of the hop hornbeam in the understory. These are the beautiful blooms of our Eastern dogwood trees. So we live in the Eastern deciduous forest. This is our biome and, and every, basically all of our spaces want to return to this mature woodland. Um, and you can still see these on the, in the bridal wild trails, for example, in our area, these signature trees. This is a chestnut oak and the beautiful bark of the beech trees, black birch on this well-drained hill, our red oaks and our white oaks. Even on developed properties, you see these beautiful species that define our area. This is the trunk of a white oak tree and a hickory tree. We really live in an oak hickory forest. And these evolved with our underlying bedrock. So this is a geologic um, sort of map of Pennsylvania here. This is Philadelphia over here. And we live in the Piedmont upland, which is the name of our eco region defined by this mustard color right here. And these are defined by the Environmental Protection Agency and also by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And you can see that we have more in common in terms of our ecological communities and bedrock northeast and southwest than we really do west to east in Pennsylvania. And we have such a rich geologic history in Pennsylvania. We used to have very, very, very tall mountains that have eroded over millions of years. And so Piedmont mean, is a French word that means um, foothills. And these foothills were the result of the sediments that eroded from these big mountains nearby us and also from the glacial out, um, outwash from areas that were glaciated north of us. If we zoom in on Lower Marion, for example, we can see that a lot of our bedrock is with Wissahick and Schist, a metamorphic rock, and also a nice and, um, and granite. We also have a little bit of serpentine. And if you get curious about, about the bedrock underneath um, your feet, wherever you are, if you're hiking or, or in your space, you can download the Rocked app and you drop a, a, a pin on the map wherever you are and it'll show you uh, the physiographic region where you live. For example, the Piedmont upland that we just talked about and that Wissahickon schist underneath our feet. More recently, the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program has defined plant communities across Pennsylvania based on what they've seen growing well together in similar conditions. There are 180 plant communities that are defined this way and these can begin to inform our own choices in our spaces. So for example, there's a tulip tree beach maple forest and these, in addition to these signature trees, you'll find red oaks and black gums and mockernut hickories, and, um, and then a layer of understory trees like our hornbeams and those dogwoods and, and um, hop hornbeams that I mentioned earlier, also shrub, uh, shrubs like spice bush, and then early spring ephemerals like our may apples and blood roots and wild leeks and spring beauties. And these are defined by natural plant communities. We can see them in our area. This is at the Haverford Reserve. Again, Wishahick and Schist underneath our feet. This is our beautiful blood, blood root, blooms early in the spring. This is a great patch of wild leeks here. Um, never dig these from the wild. We tend to over harvest and this is just a beautiful patch, but they're, they're really nice to see. We have native violets. We have may apples. Look at the carpet of may apples that we see in the woodlands nearby us. This is the, the double leaf may apple. You know it's gonna bloom here. It has a little bud. It'll make a little fruit that the box turtles love. This is an example of natural layering that we find in the woods. So these are the ephemerals that I just showed you on the forest floor here, and then a layer of shrubs above them. These happen to be maple leaf viburnum, and uh, they're just leafing out. This was last spring, early in COVID. 
We don't have too many of these left because we have an overabundance of deer and they've really eaten our understories, but this is what it, it looks like naturally. And you can see the diversity of plants as they grow together. And this can be inspiration for your space too. You can grow, grow, grow a diversity of plants uh, well together here under short <laughs> layers. May apple here with beautiful spring beauties. These spring beauties are important because they support a bee that can only eat the pollen from spring beauties. We have some specialist native bees that emerge early. And this is a tough wildflower, even though it looks delicate. So I show you all that to, sh to remind ourselves of the beauty that could exist around us and how our traditional landscaping practices are often at odds with growing those beautiful flowers and, and with the environment really. We've removed the native, native um, flora and we've replaced it with lawns that don't support any wildlife. Um, and of course, take a tremendous amount of water and chemicals to maintain as we do. And the species we've put back have generally not been native. They've been from other parts of the world that evolved with different insects so they don't serve our food web. We, rely to, we tend to rely on a lot of evergreens because we consider them low maintenance, but it really, it, it's not a natural look for our area. We have a few native evergreens, but generally we have more seasonally themed plants. And we rely too much on wood mulch, on, on bringing in products from outside to support our spaces instead of using what we have. We tend to remove what we have when we consider it debris, um, dead plant material like leaves and wood, even though these are so important to our spaces. So our first goal in um, returning in native plant gardening is thinking about our biggest native plants, which are our native trees. And I'm so passionate about these because they serve us uh, silently, but, but so well in capturing stormwater and providing our oxygen, filtering our air pollutants, filtering pollutants from the water, providing habitat, uh, sequestering carbon, storing carbon. There's so many things that our native trees do. This is a beautiful elm tree that still exists on the Swarthmore campus. And it's a reminder of how many, um, how many of our native trees have succumbed to disease. We've lost our chestnuts due to chestnut blight and our elms due to Dutch elm disease. We're losing our ash to the emerald ash borer. Our oaks are, some, are suffering. So the trees that we have left, we really need to protect and honor. Uh, learn what they are in your space. Make sure you're not compacting the soil or parking on them. Check the root flares to make sure they're not buried too deeply. And most of all, try not to cut them down. I see way too many native trees cut down and these are gifts from previous generations that we should preserve with all our might as much as we can. We have a situation with a deer that's, that's a reality that we have to um, take into account when establishing our gardens. They have basically halted forest regeneration in our natural areas because they're overpopulated. We've removed all of their predators. And so they take the plants away from other animals that need them in our spaces. So whether you have deer or not, it affects you because the plants are missing from our natural areas. And that's why it's important for us to use each of the spaces that we have in our homes to return those plants for the animals. This is an example of deer browse. These are our um, native laurels here. And you can see how they've browsed all, you know, five or six feet up so that these look very unnatural now. Still gorgeous, but they're eating all of those saplings that would otherwise regenerate our forests. What's taking the place in those holes that are left by the deer really are invasive species. And so I encourage you to look at your property and see if you have any of these. Some we intentionally grow for ornamental reasons and they escape and they're not serving our wildlife. Uh, and others um, are just sort of accidentally introduced. Two trees I want to draw your attention to are the Amur cork tree here and the Norway maple. These are very prevalent in our area. This Amur cork has a very spongy bark. If you put your fingernail into it, it kind of springs back. It has a and it has a bright yellow underlayer. These seed in like monocultures, they change the soil chemistry, they prevent our native oaks, otherwise our most valuable wildlife tree from germinating. And before you know it, you'll have a whole property line that's just a, a strip of, of Amur cork. So I encourage you to look for those and try to remove them in my opinion. The same with Norway maple, they've spread to such an extent, they've been here a few hundred years. The chemistry of this leaf is such that none of our insects can use it. So it's really breaking our food webs. 
um, and it's important to remove those. We also have a lot of non-native ground covers. By removing that English ivy and winter creeper and vinca and Japanese pachysandra, we open up spaces to reintroduce native plants with more um, ecological value. And of course, this picture reminds us to trim, to cut that English ivy at the base of our trees. Don't try to pull it off, it'll damage the bark, but cut it in a couple places and let's protect our native trees. We really have an epidemic of English ivy in our area. So this is one of the most important slides, and this is encouraging you to really get real about your microclimates in your space. Be honest with yourself about what you have. Often we look for plants that we like and try to force them into our spaces. But if we analyze our space first and try to find plants that fit those conditions, we'll be more likely to be successful with those plants. So of course, we're looking for the sun conditions. I encourage you to go out you know, two or three times a day, determine really how much sun you have in a space. This is a full sun space, for example, and it could be moist or dry, but I know it's going to be dry, partly dry because it's very, very sloped and that water is going to run off quickly. So that tells me, okay, I have dry conditions. I've also looked at the soil though, and I can see that it's gravelly and sandy. So I know it's going to drain quickly. It's going to be even drier. We're not going to change the soil here. I'm not going to add anything to it or till it. We're just going to pick plants that can take lean, well-drained, full sun conditions. That's sort of the sustainable way forward. This space over here, on the other hand, is a shady spot. And it's shady because it's under a very, very big tree. Now, shade can be moist or dry or average. In this case, it's very dry because of the kind of tree growing here. Again, this is a Norway maple. It um, has very shallow roots, takes a lot of water out of the soil, has qualities that prevent other plants from growing underneath it. So I know this is going to be a very, very, very dry situation underneath this this tree probably not a good place to in, invest in terms of putting plants in except maybe white wood aster or something it's um, it'd be a better investment to work on removing that tree over time on this side you can see a sloped um, hill here and even though it's sloped it's not that dry because uphill from it this this whole road is sort of sloped and when it rains the water runs down almost like a stream here so where this little slope levels off here is a good spot for a rain garden and, um, and so that's what we did there. So again, identify these microclimates. You can have a number of microclimates in a very small space. You might have you know, dry shade. You might have a, a wet depression at the end of your driveway. It's an opportunity to grow a diversity of plants. So let's look to some natural plant communities for inspiration for a shady garden or a woodland. Um, this is a good start because again, our area really wants to return to the woods. If you don't already have some of those canopy trees, those tall canopy trees, and you can stand another tall tree or quite a few, I encourage you to plant some first. And uh, these are ranked in order of their value to Lepidoptera, to the caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And those caterpillars are the reason that we have birds. That's how they raise their young. So the oak is most important. And there are lots of different kinds of oaks. If you, can, if you do anything this spring or fall, planting an oak is a great, great idea. Our native cherries, our native willows, our native birches, native maples, uh, crab apples, hickories, pines, these are all highly, highly valuable trees. So if you have them already, protect them. We certainly do not want to start from scratch. There's no reason to do that. Uh, but if you, if you are starting from scratch, then introduce these trees first. So this is a remnant uh, woodland, and you can see some of those tall trees. We have a tulip tree here and a native cherry. We have beech and oaks, and you can see the natural layers. Some of those layers come from different ages of trees, which are good to have in your space too, but also from understory trees like this eastern dogwood. So if you already have a canopy tree like this hickory, you might begin to add some understory trees. Often we grow trees without their, their plant companions. So this is a beautiful oak, but we're growing grass right up to the base of that oak. So it's missing its understory trees, it's missing its shrubs, and it's missing that ground layer where the birds, for example, would be looking for food in the winter or where the caterpillars that are trying to overwinter that, that used these leaves fell to the ground. There's no place for them to overwinter here. So begin to tuck in the layers into your space. This is the Jenkins Arboretum right in the parking lot. I, I encourage you to visit if you haven't seen it. They have a tall overstory tree here and they're beginning to work in these understory trees. So again, a beautiful dogwood here. This looks like a sweet bay magnolia. 
some vines, some uh, ground level plantings here. And this is important for many reasons, adding these layers. First of all, you get a lot more carbon sequestration because you have a lot more plant material growing. You get more carbon storage because you have more above ground uh, plant growth and more carbon storage in the soil with all those roots that are putting carbon into the soil. You also slow stormwater runoff because you're increasing the surface area of these leaves, which slow the rain so that it doesn't run off into our streams and erode our, our streams and you're providing habitat at different layers. So if you think about birds, for example, you'll have certain species like sparrows and morning doves who look for uh, food at the very ground layer. You might have American goldfinches in the perennial layer looking for seeds. You might have cardinals and catbirds and tufted titmice in the, um, in the sort of mid-story layer. And then up in the high canopies, you'll have scarlet tanagers and Baltimore Orioles and our woodpeckers um, in, up high. So different layers, different amounts of habitat and, um, and in environmental benefits there. Another example of a layered planting here, this is at the Mount Cuba Center. Again, a tall overstory tree, a red bud as the understory tree and large bottle brush buckeye shrubs um, providing some biomass here. Underplanting those are shorter shrubs. These are Clethra, Summer Sweet, and Virginia Sweet Spire, and then a, um, a little ground layer of perennials. So a great example of layered planting. This is a list of valuable native shrubs, again, ranked from top to bottom based on their ability to host those caterpillars that are so essential uh, to our food web. Our vacciniums, the blueberries and cranberries are highly, highly valuable, as are our native alders, our blackberries and raspberries, the American hazelnut, dogwoods, roses, service berries, um, tremendous number of shrubs. And often we leave out shrubs and and those and those understory trees in our plant in our suburban plantings. So this is the edge of my woods. And I added some overstory trees in here, uh, a river birch. I knew there was water coming off the driveway, so wanted to capture some of that. But I also added some understory trees to build out the edge of the woods because this is a, is a really valuable area of habitat for a lot of birds and, and other things. So I added a, an eastern uh, red bud in the back there and this black elderberry right here. You might do the same thing in your space by looking to see where you already have natural resources. So if you have a big patch of trees or a neighbor has some trees or some continuous shrubs, you might build from what's already existing and for example, replace lawn here with more valuable plantings and begin to wrap those around the side of your house so that it's connected. This is, these are important corridors for wildlife. This is that same elderberry shrub on the edge of my woods blooming in the spring, fantastic pollinator plant, great larval host plant in its, in its leaves. It makes berries for the birds that you see right here. And those berries are edible for humans too after you, um, after you cook them. So a great shrub, quite, quite large. If you have the space. Um, Before school. All right, Michelle, I just want to interrupt you. Somebody is, is unmuted. If you want to just go ahead and check that you're muted, thank you so much. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. Oh, no problem. So these are some more great shrubs to include. This is spice bush. Uh, you can see the beautiful yellow color here in fall. So many of our native shrubs have beautiful fall color. This is a Shrubs are male and female, and the female trees produce bright red berries for migrating birds just at the right time, highly nutritious, high in protein, uh, good for them, and blooms for pollinators in spring. This is a winterberry holly here. All of our hollies, deciduous and evergreen, are highly valuable pollinator plants, even though the flowers are quite small, and they're great larval host plants in addition to providing berries on the female shrubs. So I encourage you to work in hollies where you can. And then this is a red twig dogwood, a selection called Cardinal. Um, again, a great larval host plant and a, um, an easy care pollinator plant. All of our shrubs are basically so easy care. They add biomass and uh, structure during winter. This is the front of my road where again, I have another spice bush here mixed with an American holly. Again, the, the evergreens are not uh, characteristic of 
large parts of our area, but they're important to include. This is not only a good pollinator plant and, and has berries for the birds, but also provides nesting and area for the birds to nest and to take cover during the winter, during snowstorms and during the rain. Other important evergreens include Eastern red cedars and our inkberry hollies, in addition to our white pines. I've added a smooth sumac over here, amazing fall color, great larval host plant. If it's a female, it'll have uh, berries for that are loved by the bluebirds in the winter. This is paired with aromatic aster that I have in the front. This is a very deer resistant aster, so I'm thankful for that in deer country. And this is uh, St. John's wort, a native St. John's wort, a couple of those tucked in there, which are also quite deer resistant and great summer bloomers with pollen in particular for the native bees. So now we're moving, we've talked about overstory trees, understory trees, shrubs. Let's move to the ground layer. This is a natural grouping of Solomon seal and Jack in the pulpit. And this is a naturally occurring um, species of our Pachyra, our golden ragwort here. This is a naturally occurring community of May apple with the beautiful uh, Virginia bluebells along a stream. So we can take inspiration from these communities and begin to put them in our own gardens. This is my garden where I introduced Virginia bluebells and that the beautiful Pacra aurea, that golden ragwort there. These bloom early, early in the spring. So it's something to look forward to. It's also a source of pollen and nectar for our early uh, native bees that come out. We have over 500 species of native bees to the mid-Atlantic and some emerge quite early in the spring and so it's important to include uh, flowering resources for them from early spring through the summer all the way till until fall. This is another cultivated situation at the Brandywine Conservancy with those beautiful Virginia bluebells in mass and those Claytonia, those little spring beauties there. Of course, it takes a while to get a mass planting like this, but it's easy to start. This is another grouping of that Pacra that I showed you with the May apple, um, some violets. I just love this Pacra. It's, it's an evergreen native that stays low most of the year. So mostly you have these evergreen leaves. It's a good substitute for Japanese Pachysandra and it blooms uh, once a year for about a month. These 18 inch blooms looks beautiful in mass. So again, in the aster family serves a tremendous diversity of pollinators early in the season, is very deer resistant uh, and will help to keep invasive species at bay. I removed a lot of non-native ground covers in my space and I needed something to help me keep, keep those at bay. These are the beautiful buds that you see early in the season while it's still cold and, and that hints their purple color there and protecting them. This is another little woodland garden and um, I've created this under a black cherry tree. There was a Japanese maple here that I'm slowly taking out because the Japanese maples are or don't have the leaf chemistry that our insects can use. And when I don't see function in the plants, they don't look very pretty to me. So I'm encouraging the oaks that are naturally popping up underneath those, um, this Japanese maple to, to grow because they're so valuable. And then I encourage the American holly there as well as part of my layers. At the ground layer though, you can see we have white violets, we have foam flower, bottle brush grass that'll be blooming later in the season. There's a smooth hydrangea here. Avoid the cultivars like Annabelle because they don't serve the pollinators. They have all sterile bracts instead of uh, fertile flowers. So get the straight species on your hydrangeas. Also, I have Eastern Columbine, great for dry shade, loved by the hummingbirds, blooms early. And then later in the season, I'll have uh, multiple kinds of asters and I have sedges mixed in here. The woodland gardens, shade gardens can just be so much fun. And um, so I encourage you to try, try that. These, this is another view of the garden, again, with that beautiful columbine. I use a native ground cover called Jume fragarioides, this uh, barren strawberry down here. It's an evergreen ground cover, kind of slowly uh, creeps and, and prevents weeds from coming up. I allow the sensitive fern to, to emerge on its own and some of this, um, native knotweed, this uh, Virginia knotweed here to come up as well. And I include sedges and I pop in, you know, tree saplings here, a little dogwood that I protect from the deer. Another view of the garden. This is at Chanticleer showing that layered idea again with a lot of natives densely planted at the uh, ground level and overplanted with Eastern red buds. 
as well as another part of the garden at Chanticleer where you can see a Solomon seal here mixed with native geranium and a native clematis vine. You see some of the pink root, the red flowered plant loved by the hummingbirds and sedges. And again, those overstory trees, the understory trees, the shrubs and the ground layer. So I hope I've given you some inspiration uh, in a woodland setting for a shady garden. Let's look now at a meadow, at meadows for inspiration in case you have a sunny pocket. And, and these different microclimates, again, are opportunities to introduce new plants and support different insect species. This is the Great Swamp Wildlife Refuge and a beautiful big open meadow of New York ironweed. This is kind of a wet meadow mixed with golden rods and grasses and, and some shrubs. This is a tall stately perennial that blooms late in the summer, serves all kinds of pollinators, including this migrating monarch over here. And so in a cultivated setting, in a yard setting, you can remove the grass, begin to introduce these, this uh, meadow uh, combination with the New York ironweed, the purple flowers here. This is in combination with a false sunflower with some switch grasses, blue star, all kinds of things, and a few trees mixed in for, um, for the layered effect. This is another natural occurring meadow where you see a uh, depression in the middle supporting uh, the moisture loving Joe pie weed there and lots surrounded by lots of golden rods. And so in a cultivated setting, you might see a rain garden um, like this where you plant the the Joe pie weed in the middle where it's moist and then surround it with the more drought tolerant species that are on the sloped edges like this orange milkweed and pin stem in and some grasses. This is another meadow, a little bit drier, has four different kinds of goldenrod that I could count in addition to shrubs and the common milkweed. This is what the common milkweed looks like, of course. Milkweed is so important to include in all of our gardens, particularly if we have sun. The monarch population is really in trouble, the migrating population, so anything we can do to help them is good. And these uh, milkweeds support tremendous number of insect species in addition to the monarch. So always try to include those if you can. The shrub species in this meadow is gray dogwood, Cornus racemosa, a great wildlife plant, particularly if you have a bigger area. Uh, so in cultivation, in a, in a cultivated garden, that mil those milkweed pods would look like this in combination with a uh, goldenrod here. This happens to be seaside, seaside goldenrod, some grasses and more. This is another little, you could call it a little pocket meadow or prairie, just sun loving plants. We have so many sun loving prairie plants. So you, there's lots to choose from, but because golden rods are so valuable, I'm gonna dwell on those for a minute. This is old, early golden rod paired with aromatic aster. This, these asters will be blooming later in the season. So a valuable combination there. This is a low growing golden rod called golden fleece. And this is paired with a blue wood aster here in a nice combination at the Mount Cuba Center growing next to a shrub. This is a Virginia sweet spire. Again, golden fleece growing with aromatic aster along a pathway in a friend's garden. Uh, just a beautiful combination. If you don't have full sun, you can still grow golden rods. This is blue stem golden rod. You could also try zigzag golden rod um, because they're so valuable, they're important to in include. This is another prairie species that I just love. Leatris spicata, the marsh blazing star, it likes a little bit of moisture. Um, it has those architectural purple, purple blooms loved by bees and butterflies. The birds, of course, eat the seeds in the winter. I'm growing it here with American alum root and aromatic aster and some bee balm and some native, um, native hollies. And um, so it's just a, it's just a really great plant. I think Alice wrote in beforehand to ask for about suggestions for a narrow side yard that's a little bit shady. You might try this American alum root. Uh, doesn't get too big, it holds its shape, it blooms in August, and loved by the pollinators and is a really tough plant for a small space. There are other Liatris that bloom later than Liatris spicata. This is Liatris scariosa, and these are loved by migrating monarchs late in the season. So monarchs need, of course, milkweeds for host plants, but they need nectar plants to fuel their trip back to Mexico. So this is uh, the Eastern Blazing Star, and I'm growing it in combination with Joe pie weed and tall Coreopsis, some sunflowers, and a little hawthorn tree here. This is orange milkweed. Again, for a sunny, well-drained area, doesn't like wet feet, doesn't like standing water, but if it's well-drained and sunny, it'll um, work great for you in combination with our yellow coreopsis and some uh, dwarf ironweed. 
So we've talked about woodland inspiration, meadow inspiration. Let's turn to a stream in case you have a wet space or a stream going through. Uh, Susan wrote in to ask what could be planted along a stream. And so, of course, first, I'd like to know what species are here. If these are invasive species, which have tended to invade our moist areas, you'd want to identify what those are. I would cut them at the base. Depending on what they are, you want to look into what species you have. But cut them in the base. Continue to cut them until they are exhausted. Uh, that's a way to do it without herbicides. And then begin to replant immediately. You never want to stop there. Otherwise, you probably shouldn't remove in the first place. And um, and then determine your sun conditions. Of course, you want to cut that English ivy off those trees back there. If this is a non-native tree, I would, I would remove it. I would girdle it personally. And so uh, back to Edith Roberts and Elsa Riemann, and, and they wrote about the stream side, and they talked about the red maples. They said the red, red maples are the most conspicuous of all. Their spring twigs and swelling buds and opening blossoms are all brilliant red. And their light gray trunks are heightened by the scarlet berries of Ilus, Ilex reticulata. And they were talking about winter berries there. So they, they talked about two typical species that you see growing near streams, um, red maples and winterberry hollies. So if you have a red maple and you paired it with winterberry hollies, you can imagine how beautiful that would be and how valuable that would be to the birds. And this would be appropriate for a part sun or a sunny situation nearby uh, next to a stream. We can also look to our natural communities. This is West Mill Creek Park, and this is a floodplain. It's quite moist. There are lots of beautiful, beautiful sycamores and black walnuts here, in addition to box elders. I encourage you also to visit the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program website where they describe those plant communities because you'll begin to get ideas for plant combinations for different kinds of moisture conditions. This is an alter dogwood floodplain thicket as an example. And there are different kinds of moist conditions. There's a difference in standing water year round versus seasonal flooding. Um, there's a difference in winter water and occasional floods, um, for example. So you wanna think about that before investing in, in a big planting. But trees that do well long streams include red maple and box elder, sycamore, river birch, shrubs are native alders, not the non-native ones, but the native ones, elderberries, silky dogwood, very similar to red twig dogwood, button bush, of course, that can take quite a bit of standing water, would do well in the middle of a rain garden, and spice bush likes moisture. If you have deer, it's always important to protect your trees uh, at planting because they will rub them down even if they won't eat them. So always cage your trees. And if you need some deer resistant perennials, I encourage you to look at golden ragwort or Jacob's louder. They're very beautiful. And combine those with some ferns, some moisture loving ferns like cinnamon fern, royal fern, marsh fern, and sedges. Really the root systems of sedges, which look like sort of clump forming grasses, but they're different. Um, the roots of the sedges and the woody plants in particular really hold stream banks well. This is a cross section of a stream bank uh, reminding us that the plants, the trees and shrubs that we plant close to the water need to be able to tolerate flooding occasionally. And the ones that are further away, more upland can be more uh, dry site trees. So the trees in this column, for example, can take that, that those wet conditions and the flooding. The trees here a little further up can take a combination of, of dry and moist conditions. And these trees and shrubs like more upland conditions. If you have a waterway in your space, it's very important to have a deep riparian buffer. You need 50 to 100 feet of plantings on either side of your stream to truly support wildlife habitat on that stream, to slow stormwater, to filter stormwater pollution. This is really what it should look like on the right-hand side. You see a little stream moving through the woods, very heavy veg vegetation. You see lots of trees, you see shrubs, you see ground layer um, of ferns and other wildflowers. And this is what a healthy stream looks like and what we need uh, to keep our, our water clean and to support the, hab the habitat of the animals living in the stream and to prevent our streams from eroding heavily because we have such heavy uh, rains and stormwater runoff as a result. So another consideration in picking plants for our gardens includes thinking about high value plants. And I've, I've mentioned those already for the larva of caterpillars. We know a lot more about the science of plant and insect interactions. So we can be, begin to prioritize plants for native bees and caterpillars in our area. And so I've combined some data that comes from Doug Tallamy's work and others that's um, 
coordinated by the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder. And you'll find that goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers are the most important species for hosting the largest number of caterpillars and the largest number of specialist bees. There are some bees that can only eat the pollen of certain plants. So while most bees are generalists and can eat from a, a diversity of uh, species, some cannot. And so by, by including these in our gardens, we save those specialist species and keep our biodiversity, encourage our, uh, keep our biodiversity high. These are woody species here that also are great larval host plants and also good for specialist bees, willows, blueberries, cranberries, and dogwoods. If you visit the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder, you can find this information too. You just put in your zip code and it'll pull up those most valuable species based on the number of uh, butterflies and moths that they support. So you can see the number right down here when you click on the species. This is a list of priority native plants for specialist bees given to us by Sam Drogi. He uh, works for the US Geological Survey and he's really our native bee expert. And, um, and so in visiting his website, you can, you can see this list. I also have it on my website too. So this is a reminder about goldenrod. No, not only does it support 126 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars, it also supports this specialist bee, which can only eat the uh, pollen from that genus. And we have a tremendous number of goldenrods as I've al already talked about. This is an example planting of the three most important uh, perennial species, uh, asters, aromatic aster here, wrinkle leaf goldenrod here, and sunflowers. So a beautiful pairing there that we did in the Penn Valley Elementary School. Asters, again, support 115 species of bees and this beautiful little Andrina asteroides native bee who survives on the pollen of this plant. Asters are, are really important also for migrating butterflies late in the season. They bloom um, so late that they support, again, the nectar, nectaring needs of those butterflies. This is smooth blue aster. I encourage you to get the straight species. It's very floriferous and just a gorgeous plant. If you have shade, you can incorporate white wood aster here at the Jenkins Arboretum along their pathways. Beautiful and does dry shade well. And then we have a tremendous number of perennial sunflower species that are great pollinator plants. They host a tremendous number of um, larvae again, and also some specialist bees, this Andrina helianthi, for example. So this is a hybrid sunflower that's a great plant in a garden setting called Lemon Queen. We also have the swamp sunflower, Helianthus angustifolius. This is growing at the base of a downspout at a Redbud Nursery where it gets a lot of water and it is a showstopper late in the season. I mean, just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. If you don't have full sun, you can still grow perennial sunflowers. This is woodland sunflower, Helianthus divericatus. I'm growing this on the edge of my rain garden here. And if you're curious what species are native to our area, you can visit BOMAP, the Biota of North America program to look for range maps. The USDA also has range maps for species, but BONAP is supposed to be the most up to date. So if you're doing a Google search for, for a sunflowers, for example, you'd type in Helianthus BONAP and it would pull up these uh, range maps. So this is the, the sunflower I just showed you, the woodland sunflower. And these little green dots mean that it's native to on a county level. So you can begin to just look visually at the map and say, oh, Helianthus decapetalus is also native here. I wonder if I can find that in the trade and if it will work in my space and so on. And then you can see that others are not native to our area and are probably not good choices um, in terms of sustain sustainably growing here. This picture was sent in by Chris asking about uh, good pollinator plants for uh, uh, honeybees and also pollinator plants that could be example to the public that are important for our native bees. So thank you for that question. Um, it's always really important to plant a lot of extra floral resources if you're keeping bees because in high numbers, the non-native honeybees can com compete with our native bees for floral resources. And we've already removed so much habitat for our native bees that it's important to really amp that up where we can. So trees that are important, um, the good news for honeybees is that they're generalist species. So they can harvest from a tremendous range of plants. And by including any of them that are native, we'll be supporting our native bees as well. Early in the season, red maples are very important. Um, 
Also sour woods, that might be fun to have on the edge of this, uh, of the apiary here. They are gorgeous trees and loaded with nectar and pollen and loved by the bees at, uh, as are our American basswoods. If you're looking for a shrub that produces early for the bees, pussy willows are great. If you happen to have a little bit moisture conditions or if you can create a depression where the water will stand a little bit, willows again, really, really important if, we, if you have the conditions for them. Service berries, clethra are great for, um, for summer nectar. Sumacs are wonderful. If you're looking for perennials, uh, try that golden ragwort. You know, it's very low growing and early blooming. All of our native mints are fantastic nectar producers. And then I would encourage you to work in as many asters and goldenrods as you can. Blue wood aster might be nice around the woodland edge. It'll grow in sun or shade and just reseeds like crazy, has tons and tons of flowers on it. Calico aster is also nice as is aromatic aster. Golden fleece goldenrod is that short goldenrod that might be good around your, um, your water feature in combination with anise hypsop and orange milkweed, especially since I think you mentioned you had well-drained and sunny conditions in the middle. So I hope that helps a little bit. I don't think I answered all your questions there, but um, going forward, you might also really like this annual called Fernley Facelia. It's not really available right now, but it's a beautiful purple flowering annual that seeds in and is loved by the bees. This is from healthyyards.org. And this is a reminder that mulch, particularly wood mulch in our garden is really meant for young gardens. If you're starting a new garden uh, where you once had lawn, which is a great idea, you'll need to mulch, but you wanna plant densely enough, including all those ground uh, level, all, all those levels that we talked about so that at maturity, these plants fill in and cover the ground and you don't need to bring mulch in uh, from outside. It kind of decreases the carbon footprint and um, uses what we already have on, on the property, particularly if you use leaves as your mulch. So this is a reminder about how nature mulches where the leaves that fall under trees are perfectly uh, the right chemistry to support those trees going forward. This is an example of using leaves as mulch in a young garden uh, at the Hildesee Preserve, a natural lands trust property. And these are keeping the weeds down and uh, covering the soil in a young part of this garden. I think it looks beautiful and they tend to hold water better too than, than wood chip mulch. Wood chip mulch dries out quite easily. Here's another example of mulching with leaves underneath a little thicket of winterberry hollies. Planting a thicket like this of shrubs is always great for the birds. Again, food providing cover and, and nesting. If you can keep your leaves whole, that's ideal. And as long as they're not too thick, perennials will still come up uh, between them. And this is important because there are so many animals that are using those leaves. The cocoon of the luna moth, for example, overwinters whole in the leaves. And if you shred or blow away these leaves, you're really removing the first generation of those insects the next season. So not all, our, not all of our butterflies migrate. Many overwinter here as adults or, as, or in cocoons. And of course, our native bees, most of them are ground nesting, uh, some stem nesting, but the ones in the ground, it's a single mother, single queen who is trying to make it through the winter and a you know, little hole in the ground there. And if you remove those leaves, you're taking away her cover and her ability to survive and start her brood the next season. So be careful with your leaves and really view them as an asset versus as a liability, which is what we traditionally do. This over here is a reminder to leave them wherever you can under trees and shrubs and also on evergreen ground covers. Reduce the percentage of area that you're having to use those gas powered uh, machinery because it, they're so polluting, they're, they're loud and they really increase the carbon footprint. So wherever you can reduce using them is very beneficial. And finally, I'd like to encourage you to embrace the dynamism that happens in native gardening. And often in traditional gardening, we try to keep plants in place. You know, we have a set design, we surround them with mulch and we want them to stay there. In native gardening, you'll get a lot of reseeding and just growing through rhizomes. And this is what makes it special often. So I encourage you to embrace that. Instead of viewing yourself as an organizer of, your, of the garden going forward after you get it established, you might view yourself as an editor where you, you know, definitely editing out the invasive species popping up, but also um, just, you know, moving things around a little bit if you need to, but embracing what happens because it tends to be a surprise and exciting and nothing's ever, ever the same going forward. 
You might also allow some succession. So if you have some naturally occurring species coming up that are valuable, not that invasive species, but um, which that will certainly happen. But if you have natives, you know, embrace that and allow some oak trees to come up. If you have deer, pop a cage over and then save that oak. You know, the naturally occurring species are the most resilient often because they plant themselves the best in the most ideal conditions. It's always a guess on our part where they're gonna do well, but they tend to know best. So it's good to listen to our gardens and develop that relationship. And um, I did that here with this plant. This is Cynthia trichum ladder of floris. It's our panicled aster. And this popped up when I removed hundreds of um, non-native daylilies. And I thought I was going to have a grand design of, you know, putting putting in, you know, individual species of different things that I wanted. But this popped up immediately, and it was a lesson in humility and a great lesson because it was doing a it was doing a very important job. It was holding soil where it had been disturbed. It's known to do well in disturbed soils, which of course I did by by removing the invasive species. And so I've let it go. It runs by rhizomes, which kind of scared me at first. I thought, oh my goodness, it's gonna take over the whole garden. But now I embrace that because I see the value it brings. So all these white flowers are that aster and I just let it move all in and around my shrubs. I grow it with the goldenrod and the, and the um, dogwoods and the winterberries and my ground covers. And I really appreciate it for this reason. You can see here how many insects love it. Look at our little bees. This is our, a, a small native bee here. You saw a honeybee over here, native bumblebees. Uh, look at the pollen baskets on the back of these legs of these bees. I mean, this plant has so many flowers that the bees don't have to move very far to harvest, which means that they can take this pollen and nectar back to their broods and successfully reproduce. Everywhere you're seeing movement is a, is a bee. And um, so allowing these species to, to come up in our space is, is something that um, I think we all can embrace. This is another way that our gardens become dynamic is through reseeding. This is the seed heads of swamp milkweed in a friend's garden. And she planted a couple of these and then they just went crazy reseeding. She had really good pollination, which means she probably had really good native bee activity. And had she edited out those little seedlings early on, she would have missed the party that happened later in the season in the garden. You can see how beautiful the milkweeds are and she got to see all the monarchs on them later. So embrace some of that reseeding. This is another beautifully reseeding plant. This is cardinal flower here. Of course, I planted this one and then it seeded over here and look at what an exclamation point it really provides um, there. And then I get to see more of this and I get to support this beautiful migrating bird that comes all the way from Central America, crosses the Gulf of Mexico and comes to our area just to raise its young. So it's the least we can do, put back some of these plants that it's expected you know, over the thousands of years that it's been migrating up here. This is a native annual called partridge pea and you can introduce this yourself um, and it will kind of reseed to fill in holes. It's a wonderful pollen producer for the native bees. And Susan wrote in to ask what native uh, plants could be seeded in March and April. And I encourage you to visit some of these online nurseries and, and use their plant search functions. This is uh, Prairie Moon Nursery has a good one. If you search for germination code A, you'll see those plants that don't need what we call cold moist stratification. They don't need outdoor winter uh, temperatures, freeze and thaw to germinate. And that includes our uh, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, our native mints, uh, one of our native salvias that's a good little ground cover for uh, dry shade, for example. I will say that it's a little bit difficult to grow um, seeds straight in the ground. I mean, you'll, you'll have some success, but it's easier if you do them in pots first, grow them in pots first, and then put the plants into the ground and allow those plants to reseed on their own. Sometimes the investment in a few live plants goes a long way, uh, particularly if they reseed in future years. And part of the reason is we have so many invasive species in our seed bank, so it's hard to um, beat them to the game in, in the early spring. If you need to add legibility to your space, I encourage you to use pathways, for example, gates, um, not gates, fences is what I meant, pathways, fences, trellises, anything that adds um, an element of design will, will tame the space if you, if you need that. I use uh, just white pine needles on my pathways here and downed wood, that dead wood is so important in our spaces. I work these around and I come out to enjoy them. It's a respite for me. I know I'm supporting wildlife. I get to look and see what's blooming. There's so much going on. 
Um, they're impervious, you know, so it's so it's easy for stormwater to run through. And I really embrace the wildness and the and the tall stature of a lot of our native plants because I see what value they bring. And the pollinators often go for the tall stature plants. So that to me is beautiful. And I want to experience the wildness right outside, but those pathways um, add a little bit of legibility if you need that. This is another example of a pathway in a, in a space, um, in, a, in a yard actually, where all impervious was removed, including the driveway and walkways to really slow that storm water, provide habitat and filtering. And so this was created with arborist wood chips here. Along the side, you see false sunflower, uh, a little striped maple there, overstory trees, understory trees, you see a little pocket meadow in the front a beautiful Joe Pye weed right on the front porch. There's so much wildlife here, so many birds and butterflies to watch. It's just a joy to visit. So after establishing our gardens, we need to make sure that we're not uh, managing it in a way that's killing those insects that we've drawn to our space with these beautiful native plantings. This is a little migrating warbler. I'm always so honored to see a warbler on my space. They often fly to the boreal forests of Canada and on their return uh, back to Central and South America, they need to fuel up in a very serious way. I just learned from the um, Audubon Society of Valley Forge yesterday that half of these birds don't necessarily make it back because it's such, a, um, it's such a, a tough journey. And when they stop to fuel up, they need a lot of protein and that means insects. Here, this little warbler is hiding in some um, swamp sunflower leaves and Joe pie weed and, and the golden rods there. And so avoid the temptation to call the pesticide companies and the mosquito spraying companies. They will, these really kill all the insects in your space and they don't work very well on a, adult mosquitoes anyway. So um, on the right hand side, it's a reminder to embrace a more, a more diverse look to your lawn as well and keep some of those synthesized fertilizers um, out of your space. It's not going to look like a green carpet, but you'll feel better about what you're doing. You know, it's sort of Victorian and these are going to have a lot deeper roots. Um, and then you won't be contributing to disturbing the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle that we've done so much by um, fixing way too much nitrogen and putting it into our soils. We really can't take any more in our, in our streams. So by keeping those pesticides out, we're supporting our toads here who rely so heavily on insects as well. We're not killing those spice bush swallowtail caterpillars that are hiding in the leaves that we can't see. And we're supporting those cat um, monarch caterpillars that are using our milkweeds. I, I know of a case where uh, somebody sprayed for mosquitoes and they asked him, asked the company not to spray the pollinator garden, but the sprays drifted and you really can't avoid that drift. There are a lot of externalities to those sprays. It ended up killing all the monarch caterpillars. So just be really careful and try to avoid them. The best way to um, manage mosquito control is to support dragonfly habitat. One of the best ways. The larvae of, of dragonflies are voracious mosquito larva predators and the adults eat mos um, adult mosquitoes. Also be very careful with light. Lights at night are very confusing to migrating birds and they also draw moths in and they're not exactly sure why moths fly towards light but they do and they exhaust themselves and we're, re we're uh, losing a lot of our large moth species in particular that otherwise are very important part of our food web including food for our bats that are otherwise um, declining. So the advice from entomologist Doug Tallamy is to put your lights on a motion detector if you need them so that they come on when you need them, but they're not on all night exhausting those insects that we're drawing to our gardens. And if you have to keep a light on outside, a yellow LED light is a good choice and least harmful to wildlife. So if you can commit to some of these principles, I encourage you to join the pollinator pathway. We have one in Lower Marion and Narberth, and I'm so thankful to all of you all that have already joined. Um, we're working on updating the map. So if you don't see your butterfly on there yet, hold tight and we'll get that fixed up. But this started in Connecticut and New York and has spread here. We're the first in Pennsylvania. I'm so proud about that. And you can buy a sign for your property at the Lower Marion Conservancy, a little $10 sign here to support the effort, show people what you're doing. And um, again, incorporating native plants, removing the invasive species, leaving some of that winter habitat and avoiding the chemicals. 
So finally, these are just uh, some of the websites that I, that I mentioned earlier that, that I encourage you to visit to look for plants. Um, Mount Cuba Center has a great nat native plant finder if you haven't seen that. And my website, Wild About Native Plants, has a lot of resources with, with more plant lists for native bees and, um, and everything. So I encourage you to visit that. And I just wish you the best of luck this spring. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was excellent. Um, so everyone, we're going to get into questions in just a moment. I just wanted to highlight a few things. So like Michelle said on this slide, there's lots of resources. Some of you guys were asking about um, native plant consultants. Um, Michelle is a native plant consultant and her email address is right there at the bottom, wildaboutnativeplants at gmail.com. You can also get that through her website. Um, so. Uh, for those of you who aren't able to stay on for the questions segment, I just want to say thank you so much for joining. Um, again, the Conservancy is a membership supported nonprofit. So um, we really rely on your membership and your gifts to do our awesome programs like Michelle's um, and also uh, enable our projects in the community like stormwater greening projects, planting projects. We've planted hundreds of trees already this year. Um, we're only in March. So your support really goes a long way. So I'm gonna throw our donation link again in the chat. Um, and thank you again to our members who are on tonight. Um, I also wanna thank St. Joseph's University for hosting this um, Zoom platform. Um, and again, finally, the webinar is being recorded and we will um, email it directly to all of you reg registrants and then it'll be available on our website sort of standing long-term. So um, Michelle, I'll go ahead and get to questions. We've got some good ones. We've got some diverse ones here, okay? Uh, so I'll just go up to the top here. Um, so what would you recommend to replace wood mulch if there's concern of diseased leaves on the property to make leaf mulch? Uh, you could use pine needles instead. Uh, if you ideally you would have those on your property or get them from a neighbor, um, I tend to ask my neighbors for them before they send them off to compost. Once there's not a worry about the diseased leaves, though, I would go back to using the leaves on your property. I mean, if you have to use wood mulch, that's okay. But the idea is that you plant densely over time so that you don't need very, mul very much mulch going forward. Nice, yeah. And I think people too had a question in the chat about um, at your house, the, the what you were using for mulch on those narrow pathways, that's pine needles, right? Those are pine needles. I happen to have white pines on my driveway. They fall on the driveway, which is impervious. So when I sweep them up, instead of composting them, I just put them on my pathway. So I'm lucky that way. And they, I also grab them from a neighbor when they sweep them off their, their driveway. Um, there are long needle pine, pine mulch that you can buy. I don't know how sustainable that is. It doesn't come, you know, it comes from the south. I don't know that I would encourage that. Occasionally I get some of those um, longer leaved southern pine needles as well. I'm, I'm not necessarily encouraging that, but I, I do love the look. Yeah, well, and of course, I think we're here talking about reducing um, partially our reliance on gas powered things. And if it's being driven to the south, from yeah, the yeah. south, you know, there's going to be a, a greater carbon footprint than collecting on your own. Um, so someone else asked um, if you could recommend deer resistant natives. Is that such a thing? I mean, I know you said uh, you encourage rather fencing, actually. Yeah, well, there are deer resistant natives. It depends on your circumstances. Bottle brush, if you're looking for shrubs, bottle brush buckeyes are very resistant. Uh, pawpaw trees are very resistant. Spice bush are deer resistant shrubs, unless you have really heavy deer brows. Um, so those are some right off the top. Uh, inkberry hollies are very deer resistant if you're looking for an evergreen holly. Um, deer resistant perennials include milkweeds. They include our blue stars, our native grasses, St. John's warts, um, columbine, ragwort and then when it comes to there are some tree species that are less preferred by deer like like birches and native cherries um, beech and the hornbeams 
but they will still rub the trees. So I just really encourage caging every tree, regardless of what you read about its deer resistance, because I've seen this happen so often that trees go in and, you know, there are a lot of inputs to growing these plants. So it's really worth taking care of them after you put them in your space and just popping a little cage. I like uh, metal, lightweight metal black wire that kind of blends into the environment and um, doesn't fall down like plastic and can be reused. And I use that with rebar to protect my trees. So yes, there are some deer resistant native plants, definitely. It's just that it's gonna ultimately limit your, the diversity of plants that you can introduce. And so some protection might be in order, you know, if, you're, if you wanna support more species. Great, thank you. Um, someone asks, can you recommend a book that talks about native plants in the Philadelphia area? I believe on the pollinator pathway resources page, which I've linked to in the chat, you, we've created some um, reading guides, correct? Uh, for the, let's see, there are, there are plant lists for our eco region. I, I will say that, um, sure. the Piedmont uplands. There, so Philadelphia is technically in the coastal plain. It's a little bit different. Uh, eco region, but very close, close by. And so you can search for plants based on eco region and the pollinator partnership has a great list of plants native based on physiographic province. Um, also, there's a, a book called Pennsylvania naturally, which is part of the penny stone project, which lists plants that are native. Part of uh, the best way might be to go to the to the county level. I have a list of all the plants native to Montgomery County, for example, on my website. If you want to search that, not it's thousands of plants. So, you know, you have to find ones that are actually being cultivated and sold. And um, that comes from the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Cons Conservation Natural Resources, I think. So there's not a, a book per se that I can think of, but there are different resources with different lists. Sure, yeah. So again, those are available sort of in several places. Um, Michelle's website, wildaboutnativeplants.com, the Pollinator Pathway resource page. So that's pollinatorpathways.org. And then you can click on the Lower Marion and Narberth page and get the resources link from there. Um, so Tiffany, hi Tiffany, asked, um, do you have recommendations to save the red maples that have been attacked by the spotted lanternfly? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, hopefully the spotted lanternfly is not going to be as bad as it was last year. It was like the apocalypse last year. <sighs> Between that and COVID, it was terrible. They do like the red maples. They're not killing the red maples fully, you know, yet. So the trees are going to suffer, but they're probably going to bounce back. I don't worry about it too much that I'm not going to let the spotted lanternfly keep me from putting in a very valuable tree. The best thing to do, in my opinion, and you're probably an expert on this, Amy, but I tape the trees and then I cover that tape with something with chicken wire or something that keeps the uh, animals from getting stuck to it. You can collect hundreds and hundreds of lanternflies that way if you need to protect individual trees. Red maples are susceptible. Other native trees that are susceptible are um, the walnut family. So if you have hickories, um, they're susceptible to, to damage. Again, it doesn't kill them really. I really encourage not, um, not spraying because it kills so many other insects or not injecting the trees. It really kills so many other insects using that tree. So just do something mechanical, like put that, put that fly paper around and, and again, cover it so that it's uh, protected from, from uh, trapping other animals. Thank you. So that's a, uh, any of you who are concerned about the spotted lanternfly, by the way, um, I did a webinar last year that's available on the Conservancy's website about how to sort of tackle that problem without using chemicals. So um, Michelle's saying her preferred, one of her preferred methods is to tape the tree. So you sort of stick tape sticky side out um, and you want to protect that from birds by caging it like chicken wire of some way um, and checking it frequently. Uh, I did want to say too, I'll be delivering another Spotted Lanternfly program on April, Thursday, April 1st at um, 7 p.m. for the Narberth Garden Club. So if you guys, um, you know, stay posted on the Conservancy's website and you can learn more uh, in that webinar about Spotted Lanternfly. I think it is a misconception that um, Spotted Lanternflies are killing mature trees. They're definitely weakening them and they'll kill them in conjunction with another issue that the tree might have. But um, 
uh, a lot of these sort of research groups that are working on the spotted lanternfly haven't found that the spotted lanternfly itself will kill a tree directly by its own um, uh, attack on the tree, essentially. So thank you, Michelle. Um, okay, so we have another question. Um, someone's asking if you could comment on wild ginger. I'm not sure if they mean um, uh, if just generally or not, there's not specific question there, but. Okay, yeah, we have a plant um, with a common name of wild ginger, a serum canadense, and it's a wonderful ground cover for shady, moist conditions. It's slow growing, but it's beautiful in mass ultimately after a few years. For example, if you had a wet spot with a river birch, you could grow um, that wild ginger all around it as a beautiful ground cover in moist, um, shady conditions. Wonderful. Um, okay, let's see. Um, someone asked, do you recommend replacing grass with moss? Yeah, uh, moss will come in on its own where, where the conditions are right, particularly if you remove the leaves in a shady area. So yes, moss is a wonderful, you know, there are all kinds of mosses that are wonderful native plants. I don't have any experience with introducing those myself, but Again, they'll come up quite naturally if you stop using um, any sort of chemicals on your yard and if the grass won't grow anyway. Um, that, that tends to come in, especially if you, if you remove the leaves. Um, someone asked, can you discuss advantages and disadvantages of wood chips? I believe you touched on that just a little bit. Um, if you maybe wanna just summarize that slide again. Yeah. So. We tend to over apply wood mulch is basically the bottom line. Um, we do it, we sort of mulch on a schedule instead of doing it thoughtfully. Like, you know, when do we need mulch? You should really need mulch early in a garden's life. And we tend to not put enough plants in. And so we continue to need to mulch a lot. So the idea is to plant more densely, to put in ground covers instead of to use mulch ultimately. And what happens with mulch is if you keep applying it over and over every single year on a schedule, it builds up too much and it will often begin to rot the base of your shrubs or your trees because there's a lot of moisture that it traps around the base of a tree. Um, so you can get some disease in that. It tends to bring in some diseases too. I'm not totally familiar with all of that. Uh, and it tends to dry out differently than leaves do, where leaves regulate soil moisture much better than those mulches, than the wood uh, mulch does. Now, that being said, if you put down, um, you know, wood chips that you get from chipping a tree or something, that's not a bad thing. You know, that's a way of reusing what's on your property. And in fact, by putting a pile of those, for example, in a shady area, you can recruit some native trees to grow there. They find that oaks and hickories will pop up on their own in piles of wood chips. Uh, those tend to not be the treated wood chips that you find in bags, but wood chips that are uh, come from a naturally occurring tree that's been chipped on your property, for example. So uh, it's not, you know, they can be used for pathways and things. It's just the, the treated wood mulch that's dyed and, and brought in, you know, on a schedule versus used for strategically that, that we should probably rethink. Sure. Yeah. Um, so then another person, a couple of people asked, how, how can someone support dragonflies? And I'm assuming that's sort of in relationship to, um, they would like probably more mosquito control in their, in their yard um, and looking for truly nature's routes. So is there a way people can support those insects? Yes, yeah, that's a really good question. I didn't expand on that um, for time reasons. One thing you can do is add a wildlife pond to your space. And it's a bit of a project, but you can do it. It requires no equipment, no pumps or anything. And you allow a natural uh, ecosystem to sort of build up in that pond. There, on my website, I have a couple of resources. There's one from the Xerces Society about supporting dragonfly habitat through building wildlife ponds. And then one from um, a little how-to guide from Pat Sutton, who's another wildlife gardener. And she does wildlife ponds just very simply. It often takes a year to build up. You do have to get some mosquito larvae naturally before the dragonflies will lay. And then those larvae grow. And within a year, those larvae will voraciously eat the mosquitoes. And then you'll have more adult dragonflies um, beyond that. Other ways to support them include just, you know, supporting a wetland situation that you might already have in your space. If you have a wet depression, 
different species of dragonflies like different water, uh, different moisture conditions, for example, and often you'll get, get dragonflies just in those moist areas. So not spraying because that will kill the dragonflies too and, and just encouraging um, the diversity of insects and supporting those wet spaces that you already have. Wonderful. Um, so why don't we, there are so many good questions, people, but I want to be um, sensitive to Michelle's time. So why don't we take two more questions? Is that okay, Michelle? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we've got a um, question. What's the best way to remove an existing lawn and replace with native plants? So someone perhaps starting out. Mm -hmm. I would say if you're doing it yourself, start small. Uh, one way to do it is to smother the lawn. So you would cut it very short. You would lay cardboard or something called ram board on top of it um, or layers of, of newspaper that doesn't have like black and white sort of newspaper. And then you would cover that with a lot of leaves and organic material and you would smother the lawn. You would need to do this for a few months really to really kill the grass underneath. And then you can plant right through it is one way of doing it. Um, and that's good for a small garden bed. You can also just grub it out. You can dig it out. Um, if you have a small area, I do that often to expand my beds. I just dig out the grass and plant something new or allow that my existing garden to reseed into that disturbed area. Um, there's, you can use a sod cutter. It tends to remove some of the topsoil, but um, it's not a big deal depending on the underlying conditions. And um, those are the main ways without chemicals to go about that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, there's also on the Conservancy's website, we have a rain garden guide. And I think we have some tips in that guide about smothering and sort of choosing the best method for your lawn. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I love this question. So this will be the last question. And again, sorry, everybody, we won't get to everyone's questions. There's so many good ones in there. Um, but so do you know of any at risk endangered or rare species of plants that we should plant if we can? That's a good question. It's a little complicated because a lot of our species are um, rare because their range was originally limited here anyway. So for example, coastal plain plants like Ilex glabra, our inkberry holly, is an endangered species in Pennsylvania. And it's surprising because it's one of, it's uh, highly available at, at the nursery. We sell them almost to everybody who comes in because they're a good kind of boxwood substitute. So, um, uh, Sporobolus heterolopus is another one. It's a prairie drop seed. Um, and I believe side oats gramma grass is, but again, side oats gramma, for example, had a very, has a very narrow range in Pennsylvania. You generally only find it on calcareous, you know, um, hilltops, although it has a wide range of conditions that it'll grow in. That's not a very good answer, but it's a little bit complicated. Green and gold is another one that's very limited. Um, I'm trying to think what resource to provide you where you can see those lists, but, um, Introducing rare plants is not a great idea anyway. And I know it sounds like we, you know, a good idea to support them, but if it's, if it's not a local ecotype, if the genetics is not the same as our local rare plant population, they can all often end up crossing. And um, so it's, it's best to protect rare plants where they exist as opposed to introducing them is my first instinct to tell you, but, um, I understand what you're asking and I hope you understand my answer about, about limited ranges and so forth. And things are gonna be changing with climate change too. You know, Plants are gonna be migrating north and higher in altitude. So from that perspective, it's a good idea to introduce plants that are naturally occurring in our range, but at the Northern edge of a Southern range, for example, to support those plants as they come um, north and the insects and animals that, that need them. Thank you. I know that is, I think, a tough question and there's so many um, layers. So I think you mm -hmm. addressed, I think as best you could, some of those layers. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I totally agree, like protecting natives where they are is, is so important as well. So I think for those of you, it's general practice not to remove natives uh, if you can, um, but you can buy plugs rather and add them to your garden. Um, 
and, and those types of things. So um, thank you so much, Michelle, for doing this uh, talk for us. Um, and everybody who came on, thank you again for joining us. Um, if you want to join the Pollinator Pathway, which is uh, an initiative Michelle in helped uh, the Conservancy introduce, along with several other community partners um, to Lower Marion and Narberth, um, there's more information on the Conservancy's website about that um, and sort of some of the tenants that would um, qualify your property for a um, registration on the Pollinator Pathway. So thank you again, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Good luck. Thanks.